tonight. Argentina Senate. Argentina Senate passes Millet reform bill amid protests. Forcibly displaced. 117 million people were forcibly displaced by the end of 2023, marking the highest number on record. Gang violence. Over 4,000 residents flee a town in southern Mexico after armed gangs started shooting and burned homes. Friendly travel. Dog's first ever airlines expands its service with five new destinations. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Other Than a World News Tonight. Good evening and thank you for tuning in tonight on World News. We have lots of fresh updates to bring you and we begin in Kuwait. At least 49 people died and 50 were injured yesterday in a fire at a housing building in the city of Mangav. According to reports, 42 Indian nationals died, with migrant workers from Egypt, Pakistan, the Philippines and Nepal also among the casualties. A Kuwaiti police official said that the cause of the fire in the six-story building is unclear, but the presence of more than 20 cooking gas tanks in the overcrowded block caused the fire to spread quickly. Kuwaiti Deputy Prime Minister Sheikh Fahad Yusuf Saud Al Sabah blamed building code violations and the greed of real estate owners for the fire during a visit to the site on Wednesday. Forensic police say most of the fatalities were caused by suffocation. Argentina's Senate passed a key bill for libertarian President Javier Millet's economic reforms, with Vice President Victoria Villarreal breaking a tie with her deciding vote. Argentina's Senate passed a key bill for libertarian President Javier Millet's economic reforms on Wednesday. While outside Congress, raging protesters set fires and clashed with police. The bill was passed after a long debate with Vice President Victoria Villarreal breaking a 36-36 tie with her deciding vote. For those Argentinians who deserve to regain the pride of being Argentinian and always thinking of everything for Argentina, my vote is affirmative for today's Order 3724. Senators will now vote on articles aimed at boosting investments by privatizing state entities and doling out incentives for businesses. The bill passed the lower house in April, but will now return for another vote after Senate changes. It's a crucial piece of Millet's plan to reform Argentina's struggling economy, with plans to tackle high inflation, expand presidential powers, and stimulate investment. But some protesters fear it would increase their vulnerability to high unemployment and consumer prices. Luis D'Elia, a long-time activist on the left, was outside the Congress Wednesday. Argentine people's lives are at play. We've drank this poison several times. To have zero inflation with zero economic activity, with government scrapping and foreign debt. This poison has failed several times in Argentina, and we won't allow for this to carry on. Argentina struggles with nearly 300% annual inflation, stringent capital controls, depleted foreign reserves, high debt, recession, and rising poverty. The U.S. has announced new sanctions on Russia ahead of the G7 summit in Italy, as four Russian military vessels, including a Navy frigate and a nuclear-powered submarine, arrived in Cuba in what is seen as a show of force. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, aboard Air Force One en route to Italy, told reporters that more than 300 new sanctions were being introduced, largely focused on deterring Russia from obtaining key technologies through individuals and companies from countries such as China, the UAE and Turkey. Meanwhile, only 150 kilometers from the U.S. soil, a fleet of Russian Navy vessels reached Cuba after conducting high-precision missile weapons training in the Atlantic Ocean. A U.S. official speaking to the Associated Press called it a routine port call that posed no threat to the United States. However, Russia's visit is seen as a show of force, as well as a reminder that Russia has allies in the region, including Cuba and Venezuela. 
The issue of North Korea's human rights took center stage at the UN Security Council on Wednesday, with South Korea chairing the meeting as the rotating president this month. Last August, the UN Security Council held a meeting to discuss North Korea's human rights violations. A meeting to discuss such issues at the UNSC at the time was the first of its kind in six years as Seoul, Washington and others shed light on the fact that Pyongyang has been using its scare resources to fund its weapons of mass destruction programs instead of helping the heavily impoverished people of North Korea. Fast forward 10 months later to Wednesday, where under the rotating presidency of South Korea, the UNSC once again convened a meeting in New York to bring to attention the plight of North Koreans and its security implications. South Korea's ambassador to the UN, Hwang Jung-guk, presiding over the open meeting, stressed that the North Korean regime wants to keep the people in the dark and try to repulse the outside light with their draconian control and nuclear weapons. He further emphasized that if human rights violations stop in the reclusive state, nuclear weapons development will also stop, adding that the global community needs to look at North Korea's human rights situation from the perspective of international peace and security. The meeting, however, was met with opposition from North Korea's traditional allies in China and Russia. The Russian ambassador to the UN slammed the meeting, saying that while the global community looks toward the UNSC with the hope that it will resolve complicated global issues, it is squandering resources on a discussion of groundless and blatantly politicized matters. China's ambassador to UN reiterated Beijing's stance that the council is not the proper venue to address human rights issues. Before the start of the meeting, 57 UN member states and the delegation of the European Union issued a joint statement calling on all UN members to work together to bring concrete change that will improve the lives of North Koreans and contribute to a more peaceful and secure world. In 2023, a record of 117 million people were forced from their homes globally, nearing 120 million by estimates from the UN Refugee Agency. The High Commissioner for Refugees emphasized rising displacement driven by conflict and persecution. Some 117 million people were forcibly displaced by the end of 2023, marking the highest number on record according to the latest statistics from the United Nations Refugee Agency. Speaking earlier this week, the UN's High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, said the number of forcibly displaced people has been increasing every year for the past 12 years. The last figure that uh, we have been sharing with you, if you recall, was 114 million. So we estimate that the most updated figure is now 120 million. So it has gone up by another 6 million. These are refugees, asylum seekers, internally displaced people, people f being forced by conflict, by persecution, by different and increasingly complex forms of violence. The UN's new report on global trends in displacement estimates the number has only increased in the first four months of 2024, with conflict being a major driver of displacement. Grandi singled out the war in Sudan as one of the most catastrophic ones. It is a crisis that, and this is not applying to you who report from here, so hear about that a lot, but generally, doesn't really make it to the headline, is a very forgotten crisis, although it's one of the most catastrophic ones, not just in terms of displacement, but in terms of hunger, lack of access, violation of human rights, and so forth. Speaking on Gaza, Grandi cautioned that with Israel's offensive forcing around 1.7 million people into internal displacement, that's nearly 80% of the population, many of them displaced multiple times, people fleeing Israel's military operations from the southern border town of Rafah into Egypt could lead to catastrophic consequences. Especially, he says, because there's no guarantee they'll be able to return. Since the start of the war in Gaza, Palestinian detainees in Israeli jails have reported systematic ill-treatment by prison authorities, accusing them of intentionally withholding essential medical care. 
Palestinians held in Israeli detention since the start of the war in Gaza say they faced systemic ill treatment by prison authorities, whom they accused of deliberately withholding vital medical treatment. This is former detainee Alam Hijazi speaking from Kamal Adwan Hospital in Gaza after his release. The water is not suitable for drinking. There is no medicine or clothing. Do you know that these clothes will be a memory because it protected me? I have worn this top in these trousers for eight months. I have worn these clothes for eight months. For eight months. The clothes are in bad condition and inhumane treatment. God is our suffice and the best disposer of our affairs. Human rights groups and international organizations have alleged widespread abuse of inmates detained by Israel in raids in the occupied West Bank and in Gaza. They described abusive and humiliating treatment, including holding blindfolded and handcuffed detainees in cramped cages, as well as beatings, intimidation and harassment. There are people who are dying, says former detainee Atta Shabbat. There are people who say that their families assume they are dead. The Israeli military has said it is investigating the allegations, but has declined to comment on specific cases. A spokesperson said on Wednesday that details of the investigation would be shared when they were ready. At least 18 Palestinians have died in Israeli custody since the start of the war, the Palestinian Prisoners Association said on Wednesday. It says Israel has arrested more than 9,000 Palestinians from the West Bank since October 7, with thousands more, quote, forcibly disappeared from Gaza. It said their exact number was unknown, as Israel has refused to disclose how many Palestinians from Gaza it was holding. Widespread reports of mistreatment of detainees in Israeli prisons have added to international pressure on Israel for its conduct in the war. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. The streets of the now deserted town of Tila in Mexico are lined with burnt homes and bullet riddled cars. The residents fled following a brutal three-day siege by heavily armed men. Burnt homes and cars riddled with bullet holes line the streets of the now deserted town of Tila in Mexico. The town's 4,000 residents fled after an intensive three-day siege by heavily armed men. The chaos began on June 4th when dozens of armed men arrived in trucks and began shooting at houses and businesses and setting buildings on fire, witnesses say. This man, who did not identify himself for safety reasons, said the men returned the next day wearing military outfits and were armed with high-caliber weapons. The violence lasted until June 7th when the army arrived. State authorities said some 5,000 troops were deployed to the area and detained six suspects. Tila sits in Mexico's Chiapas state, once relatively untouched by gang violence, but now the site of a turf war between the Jalisco New Generation Cartel and Sinaloa Cartel. Despite government troops now patrolling the streets, Tila's residents are too afraid to return. Many have found safety in nearby shelters. The government maintains the violence in Tila resulted from a local land dispute, but residents say violence has increased in recent years and that organized crime groups have long been extorting them. On the road to White House tonight, voters over the age of 50 in the key battleground state of Arizona strongly favored Donald Trump in November's election rematch. A new poll from the U.S.'s largest organization for older Americans show a potential new weakness in Democrat Joe Biden's support. Arizona voters overall favor Republican Trump over Biden by 45 percent to 37 percent, with 11 percent of support going to independent candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Trump's lead is greatest among voters aged 50 and older, showing a fresh weakness for Biden, whose support among voters without college degrees and black voters has dropped since 2020.
Congo's first female Prime Minister, Judith Suminwa Toluka, was sworn in as part of the new 54-member government after six months of delays due to internal wrangling over positions. Democratic Republic of Congo finally swore in its government on Tuesday after six months of delays. That includes Congo's first female Prime Minister, Judith Suminwa Toluka. President Felix Tshisekedi won a second term in late 2023, in elections that also handed his sacred union coalition around 95% of seats in the National Assembly. However, internal wrangling over ministerial posts has delayed the government's formation. And that's against a backdrop of challenges facing the Congolese people, ranging from the impacts of climate change to rebel violence in the East. Andre Mashongo is a National Assembly member. La pérennisation de la gratuité de l'enseignement primaire. Firstly, make free primary education a permanent feature, which is very important. Deuxième chose. Secondly, make the population feel secure. Securing the population means putting an end to the war imposed on us by our neighbors, in particular the Rwandans. Thirdly, the social welfare of the Congolese people. Du peuple congolais. The new government comprises 54 ministers. That's a smaller than expected downsizing from 57, despite pressure to reduce costs. Referring to the delay in forming the government, the president's communications director has previously said it took time for the different parties in the ruling coalition to find a compromise. Better that, he said, than a country full of conflict. U.S. President Joe Biden will sign a new security agreement with Ukraine to pledge America's long-term support to the country during his meeting with the leaders of the G7 in Italy. Joe Biden will sign a new security agreement with Ukraine at the G7 summit on Thursday, according to a top U.S. official. The president on Wednesday departed for Italy on Air Force One for his meeting with leaders of the Group of Seven Democracies. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan told reporters on the flight the agreement would make clear that U.S. support for Ukraine would, quote, last long into the future, particularly in the defense and security space. Sullivan added the pact will include a commitment to working with the U.S. Congress on funding Ukraine going forward, but will not commit to using U.S. forces on the ground. The White House had said earlier that Biden will meet again with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky at the summit. G7 leaders will address multiple challenges during the June 13th to 15th meeting. They include wars in Ukraine and the Middle East, trade imbalances with China, threats posed by artificial intelligence, and development challenges in Africa. Shoring up funding for Ukraine will be a top priority. U.S. and European officials are eager to lock in solutions ahead of a possible Trump re-election and the uncertainty it would raise over future U.S. support for Kyiv. Sullivan said the U.S. is, quote, making good progress on an innovative plan to use Russian assets frozen in the West to provide Ukraine with a large upfront loan to secure Kyiv's financing for 2025. Biden will press other G7 leaders to agree to using some $281 billion of Russian central bank funds to back up a $50 billion loan to Ukraine. Let's go for a short break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. U.S.-based dog-friendly airline that launched its first flight in May has expanded its portfolio by adding five new destinations. U.S.-based Bark Air, the dog-friendly airline that announced its maiden flight in May, has added five new destinations to its portfolio. The company said Wednesday that it will now offer flights to Paris, France and expand its domestic service to Chicago, San Francisco. Phoenix and Miami. That's in addition to its current services to New York, Los Angeles and London. The Dog First airline provides services such as speedy check-ins, doggy champagne and options for an on-flight spa experience. Well, that is all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News. 
Tune in again tomorrow for more key updates from across the globe. Stay tuned as I will be back in just a moment with the Nile Business Report. Thank you for watching and good night.